peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Yesterday, uh, Marion and I were sitting outside the Black Cow Coffee Shop. Uh, we had done some stuff in the morning and we had a little bit of a break. And it was a nice day. And as I looked through the grating on the table, I noticed this penny on the ground. Um, and I debated whether or not it was worth the effort to pick it up because we had been raking leaves for a couple of hours and I was a little sore and I thought, it's just a penny and the amount of work it's going to take to bend over and pick it up might not be worth it. But uh, as you can see, I picked it up and I think I said something to Mary and like, oh, I've got my sermon illustration for tomorrow. That's why God put that penny there so I would have a sermon illustration to talk to you about pennies. Penny, which um, I hope you take the chance, or took the chance, to read the inside of the bulletin where Lynn talks about the mite, um, which was a coin. It's, that's the English name for that coin. Um, it's a mite. What do you know about mites? You know the bugs, right? The little tiny bugs that are called mites. They're so small. Um, well, that's why the coin was called a mite, because it's a small coin. As Lynn says, um, you work for six minutes and you would earn a mite. You would have to work for less than a minute to earn a penny, according to minimum wage. According to minimum wage, um, you would, for a minute, you would earn 1.2 cents. 1.2 cents, right? To earn a penny. Not worth it to pick it up, right? I did. <clears throat> I'll put it in the um, the jar. What are we working on now, Karen? What do we collect the money for now in the world? Hunger. World Always hunger. World. Always world hunger. Good. I'll put the penny in the jar. Um, and will it make a difference? I don't know, if we all put a penny in the jar, we'd have a few bucks anyway, right? And I, I find this gospel reading a little bit confusing for two reasons. Uh, one of them, and I'm specifically speaking about the second half of the gospel, where Jesus is in the treasury, uh, near the, in the temple, near the treasury with his disciples, and he points to a rich man who puts money into the offering plate, and then a poor widow who puts money into the offering plate, and I find this, con this gospel a little confusing for two reasons. One, because of the assumptions that we bring to it, the assumptions that we bring to our reading of this gospel, and secondly, because of actually the things that Jesus says. That might need a little clarification. The assumptions that we bring to it, when you hear the words poor widow, what do you think? Um, you think an old woman um, who probably didn't have many resources, poor, in fact, in that time in Israel, um, the words poor widow were almost a redundancy. Most widows were poor. There was a whole class of society that was at the very bottom, and we hear the prophets talk about them often because these three groups of people who are grouped together um, become a sort of an understanding about how we treat these three groups of people shows how much we're reflecting as a society God's love and presence in our midst. And those three groups of people are the widows, the orphans, and the stranger, the foreigner or the alien in your midst. Because they were the people most in need. They were the people most vulnerable. So kind of when we think widow, we think somebody who is, we think of a woman who is poor and probably old or older. Um, and this is the picture that we bring to our minds when we hear Jesus talk about a poor widow, we kind of, at least I do, maybe I should only speak for myself, I kind of see her tottering up to the, uh, the offering plate there in the temple and dropping in her two coins, her two tiny um, coins that aren't worth really very much at all, and then kind of tottering away. Um, because that's the image that comes to mind, and I want to suggest to you that that image might not at all be true, that that's an assumption that perhaps you, as well as I, make about the text that is not accurate. Um, my friend, Pastor Bill Dameron, who's at uh, St. Luke Luther, Luther Church in New Rochelle, there's a picture of this scene in one of their stained glass windows, and the woman putting the two copper coins into the treasury who's actually very young, and she has a, an infant in her arms. Mm. And um, <clears throat> I read that of women in our country over 18, 10% of that total population are widows. So, so when you think of a widow, what we think of is a woman who has lost her husband due to death. And that death could also be his older age, but it could be any number of things. 
If you get into some of the more violent communities in our city and in our country, you will find widows who are younger and younger because their husbands have died because of drug abuse or violence in the streets or because they've served in the military and not come home again. Um, this image then of, of the widow being an elderly woman who's just barely making it along and drops her offering in and then totters away is probably not accurate. That she might have been a young woman who, because of life circumstances, found herself widowed and therefore without resources. Without resources, especially in the culture of that day. The man made the income. A woman gained income mostly if she was attached to a man um, through marriage. When she became widowed, she would move back in with her family. And you can imagine how excited they were about that, about having another mouth to feed, or perhaps two or three, depending on the amount of children that she had already had. So the widow might have been a very young woman, as depicted in the window at St. Luke. The other thing that I think um, is a little strange is what is exactly Jesus saying here about the example of the widow in comparison and contrast to the rich man? He says that the rich man gave out of his abundance, the rich people that he saw putting money in the offering plate gave out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had all of her resources, Jesus even specifically says, everything she had to live on. Now, being the practical people that we are, we hear Jesus say this about the woman, and we're not sure if he's praising her, because again, our assumption is, well, that's a dumb thing to do. How's she going to buy food for herself and any dependent children that she might have? What makes her so rash as to take all of her resources and put them in the temple treasure. To take those mites, those widow's mites, as we've called them, as they become almost proverbial, and put them in the offering plate. That doesn't seem to make sense. Most of us would say that that's not practical. If one of you came to me and said, you know, Pastor, I know the church needs money, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell my house, I'm going to cash in my retirement account, and I'm going to give it all to the church, I would most likely say, I don't think that's a good idea depending on whether or not we've just had a council meeting and considered the budget. <laughs> so choose carefully if you want to make that offer to me. Timing is everything. But I would argue with you that God gave you the resources that you had for your sake and for the sake of others. And I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense for this woman to give everything that she had. So we hear Jesus extol her or hold her up as an example or at least say she has given more than everybody else. Is he complimenting her or putting her out as somebody who's not really thinking very carefully about her finances? We've assumed all along that she, he's complimenting her, that she has given out of her need and not out of her abundance. But what if that's not true? So we find ourselves in a little bit of a dilemma here between a rock and a hard place as we think about this gospel reading. What's the message for us? I want to dwell for just a minute on that statement that Jesus makes that all the rich people gave out of their abundance. What he means is that they gave because they had plenty. And they weren't really going to hurt by giving money into the treasury. Even though it was large sums, compared to their annual income, this was practically nothing. We don't know if they tithed or not, if they gave the 10% as recommended in, in the Old Testament. But they gave a rich amount into the treasury. And if you were a treasury official, if you were a temple official, that made you feel good. You knew that you could sustain the temple for another day. And, and the other thing we want to think about is that the temple was a massive operation. It was the biggest thing that anybody in Israel would have seen. And it cost a lot to run it. Hence the money changers who were changing the regular currency into temple currency often cheated people to help make more money. It was a lot of money to run the temple, like it's a lot of money to run the church, right? Like it's a lot of money to run your households. But what Jesus says is that those people gave what they had out of their abundance. They weren't going to miss it. They needed to get a tax break, so they gave a big donation to the temple. And then they got the little statement later so that they wouldn't have to pay as much in taxes. Maybe that was their motivation for giving all of that. And how many people ask for money these days, right? We have a landline phone in our house for two purposes. One, for all the solicitations that we get from people asking for donations or votes, and two, so my mom can call me. That's the only reason. If my mom used a cell phone, we wouldn't need a landline all the time. And, and I have to say, thank God for caller ID. 
because we get tons of, and you probably experienced this yourself, out of area, unknown, um, or it'll tell you who actually is calling. And most of the time, we don't answer our landline because it's people who are asking for money. And so you get assaulted over and over again, and you begin to get donor fatigue. I don't know who to give to now. We'll just give to the regular people that we've become accustomed to. And we'll give them out of our abundance because it gets annoying to be asked all the time for money. Doesn't it? Which is why we don't do it enough here at Emmanuel, I guess, because I'm sensitive to the requests that people make of you. What is the example of this widow that Jesus points to? I want to do a little bit of reinterpretation with you, if I may. And I want to thank Lynn and Keith Beard for taking care of this for me. As you see on the cover of your bulletin, this is a mite. And Jesus tells us that the widow put in two, our translation, copper coins, or two mites. The King James Version will call them the widow's mites. And it looks like this, and Lynn explains inside the bulletin the value of this mite. And it's small, hence it's called a mite. But I want to think about this for a minute with you. What if we reimagine that word and think that the widow gave out of her mite? that it was the widow's might that caused her to donate what she did to the temple treasure. Just think about that for a moment. <clears throat> she goes to the treasury. It's this massive building. There's stuff going on all the time. It's the biggest operation, as I mentioned, that anybody had ever seen. And she knows, as everybody else knows, that it costs a lot of money. She sees the personnel running around there. She sees everything that's happening. And she thinks to herself, what difference do my two small coins make? They probably make no difference whatsoever. It's not going to balance the temple budget. It's not really going to help. Compared to what all these other people are putting in, my donation doesn't make a difference at all. And yet, she still makes the donation. If she's thinking economically, she's wasting her time. And if Jesus is thinking economically, if he's recommending to his disciples that they just put in two small copper coins because that'll do the job, then he's also wasting his time. There's something else going on here is what I want to suggest to you. And that something else is that the widow's offering is not really to sustain the temple treasury at all, but is a mark of her relationship to God. It's a mark of her relationship to God. She gives because she knows that God has blessed her with what she has, and she wants to share it back with God. And for her, the way to do that is to give the money into the temple treasure. That's how you do it. And so because she knows that that vertical relationship with God is so important in her life, she reflects it in her giving of her small fortune, if you will, for the sake of the temple. Or wherever it goes. That was inconsequential. What mattered was that she gave because she understood that it was a gesture that she made towards God in celebration of their relationship. In that case, this woman is not giving simply of her might, but she's giving of her might, of her strength in her relationship with God. She gives out of this relationship, and she gives with strength and purpose. Why else, I ask you, would she give all that she had, everything she had to live on? Economically foolish, faithfully sound. Now, I'm usually reluctant to make too many assumptions about things that are not stated in the story. But let me go out on a little bit of a limb with you here and suggest to you that we don't know how many times this widow has done this. Maybe every week when she got those two small coins, she went to the treasury and dropped them in. Maybe every week, taking that risk, she found that one way or another, God provided for her needs. That somehow God made it, made it work so that she could live another week. And therefore, she gives those two coins as a gesture of gratitude for God providing for her, knowing that God would do so again. Out of the might and strength of her faith, she gives of herself. Not worrying about the economy of the temple, but more focusing on her relationship with God that makes that offering important and meaningful to her. She gives her might, her all, 
into that relationship. It's an understanding of stewardship, of offering, of support, of generosity that is so important to us as we get hounded for donations from all kinds of things. All kinds of causes, all kinds of people, all kinds of need. You can almost name the niche need and somebody will be collecting money to address that need. In fact, if you're um, curious about this, I suggest that when one of those envelopes comes in the mail for some kind of a niche need, I don't know, saving um, former racehorses or whatever, give them five bucks. And then just out of curiosity, make a pile of all the other requests that come in related, if you will, to that kind of a niche need. So now you're not only saving retired racehorses, but you're saving old farm pigs and retired zoo elephants and all. I'm telling you, if you've probably experienced this yourself. It just comes in like crazy. That's not why we give. We give because God has been so generous to us that it's our joyful response to take the risk of giving to the point where it really makes a difference, not necessarily to that cause to which we are giving, but to us. You know, I've been, uh, I've been a pastor for a little while now, as you can tell from the um, fading uh, right sign of my age right there. Um, and in the course of my ministry, as you can imagine as well, there have lots of, there have been lots of stewardship campaigns that have come by. And one of them a while back was Give Till It Hurts. And then a um, the follow-up to that was Give Till It Feels Good, Give Till It Doesn't Hurt Anymore, uh, however you want to put that. The point is that we are invited as God's children to give out of our abundance, which is God's abundance. Why does Jesus seem to hold up the widow as a good example of what it means to be a steward of God's resources? Because along with giving her might, she gave out of her might. She gave out of the strength of her relationship. She trusted that God would care for her. And whether this is the first time or the 100th time that she has made this gesture of trust, she becomes an example in Jesus' eyes to his disciples of a person of faith. I would like to tell you, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up in case you're wondering, I'd like to keep you aware of that. I would like to tell you that this scripture reading comes along in the month of November, coincidentally, has nothing to do with the fact that we'll have a budget meeting in two weeks. I'd like to tell you that, but it wouldn't be true. I will tell you that we don't pick the scripture readings, but they come to us, and they're used by many, many other denominations of Christians as part of what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. Common because so many churches use it. But don't fool yourselves. The people who put that lectionary together know that November is stewardship month, if you will. And so they want to include readings that will focus in on our need to give. So it's not coincidental that we have this example of the widow, but it is serendipitous, right? To be reminded that one of the major ways we exercise our relationship with God is through our practice of generosity. By giving it away. By sharing out of God's abundance for the sake of others. It becomes almost for us in our current society and, um, and the way that we measure one another and that your value is measured by the dollar sign. It becomes a way in our society where we almost draw the line. God, I'll trust you thus far. I'll give you a week, two hours, a week um, of my time. I'll remember to pray every day. But when it comes to giving generously, sometimes we hold back. We feel a little restraint there. We're not sure. Um, nobody, nobody wants to pay for garbage pickup at the church. We like to feed the hungry. That's a good thing. There's nothing sexy about garbage pickup. And yet it's one of the realities that we deal with, right, because we live in this world. They're not taking it away for free, sisters and brothers. Um, yes, we have solar panels. We still have a little bit of an electric bill. Nobody would like to pay the electric bill. Maybe you'd like to pay for the pastor's salary. I don't know what you consider valuable or worthwhile. 
But the reality is that we give not because the church has specific bills or because there are specific causes. We give because God has blessed us. And our return shows that we too give our might, our strength, our joy, and the relationship that God has established with us. Give, give, until it strengthens you in that relationship. Give from your might.